In this tutorial, we'll be looking at factors that affect your health, and it's another AQA-specific tutorial. By the end, you should be able to describe how diet, exercise, and inheritance affect your health. You should be able to compare food labels and evaluate how healthy a food type is. And you should be able to evaluate slimming claims by analyzing scientific studies. When we have an unbalanced diet, it can lead to a condition called malnutrition, where we don't have enough of every type of nutrient. This is not the same as starvation, where we simply don't have enough food full stop, but rather we are lacking in specific nutrients. And you can be overweight, underweight, physically fit, slim, etc., and you can still have or suffer from malnutrition. It's an incredibly common problem. So moving straight on to aim one, one of the factors that affects our health is overeating, particularly when we're focusing on carbohydrates and fats, which can lead directly to a problem called obesity, which is when we're about 20% above our normal recommended body mass. Obesity is linked to a whole host of problems, such as 1. Arthritis, when we develop swollen, painful joints. 2. Type 2 diabetes, when our organs stop responding to a hormone called insulin, preventing us from controlling our blood sugar level. 3. If we take too much salt into our diet, it can raise blood pressure, and that has been linked to increasing the chances of developing heart disease. Also, if we consume too much fat, particularly saturated fat, it can lead to an increase in cholesterol in our body, and that has also been linked to increasing the chance of developing heart disease. Overeating has also been linked to increasing the risk of developing certain cancers, such as bowel cancer. Our health can also be affected just as much by undereating, so overeating is not the only issue. Undereating can cause problems such as fatigue, that's general tiredness, it can stunt our development, so it can slow our physical growth down. It can affect our immune system, making us more prone to catching infectious diseases. It in females, it can lead to irregular periods, and also it can cause problems called deficiency diseases. That's when we're deficient in specific vitamins. For example, if you are lacking, that's what deficient means, if you are lacking in vitamin C, it can lead to scurvy. But diet isn't the only issue. Also, exercise is just as important to our health. So a lack of exercise can cause the following problems. Um, obviously, if we're not exercising as much, we're using less energy from our food, so more will be stored as fat. Also, if we're not exercising as much, we are not going to develop as much muscle. So that will also lower our metabolic rate. And lowering our metabolic rate can lead to obesity. We'll have a look at that in just a second. And finally, and unfortunately for some, life just isn't fair. Some factors are actually inherited. In other words, they're encoded in your genes. One example of this is having an underactive thyroid gland. This gland is located in your throat region. And if you have an underactive thyroid gland, it will lower your metabolic rate, which, as I said before, can lead to obesity. We'll have a look at that. Um, also, some people are born with an increased blood cholesterol, which I said before has been linked to an increased risk in developing heart disease. For those of you who are still stuck or confused with the relationship between energy intake, metabolic rate and obesity, I'm hoping this might help clear it up. Imagine this hypothetical uh, analogy. We have one organism made of nine cells and organism B here made of four cells. Now let's say every cell has an energy demand of one joule. Okay, so in other words, organism A has an energy demand of 9 joules because it has 9 cells, and organism B has an energy demand of 4 joules. Okay, so we're using these two scenarios to represent organisms of different body mass. If you remember, a bigger body mass means a higher resting metabolic rate. Now let's say that both these organisms consume a chocolate bar which contains 9 joules of energy. You can see that organism A will be able to utilize all of those nine joules, whereas organism B will have five joules of energy left over. So five joules of that energy will be converted to body fat. So you can see how prolonged consumption of this chocolate would result in organism B getting larger and larger and larger. Now let's repeat this analogy, but this time both organisms have the same mass, but there is another difference now. Organism A has a higher muscle content. So let's say all those cells represent muscle cells, whereas in organism B, it's largely fat. Now, muscle has a higher resting metabolic rate than um, fat. It has a higher energy demand. So let's say that every cell here requires two 
joules of energy, 2, 2, 2, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. So in total, person A has an energy demand of 18 joules of energy, whereas person B, who doesn't have that muscle, let's say all their cells require one joule of energy, so in total, organism B requires only nine joules of energy. Now, once again, if they consumed, let's say, a chocolate bar, which, let's say, contains 18 joules of energy, you can see organism A will utilise full 18 joules, whereas organism B will have 9 joules spare. So once again, you can see how this leads to more fat development. You could apply exactly the same logic to more exercise. If you exercise more, then we know the metabolic rate of cells goes up. So let's say these will now have, in the exercising organism, double the energy demand of this one. So once again, we're back to our 18 joules versus only only 9 joules in organism B. So once again, if we consume that 18 joules bar of chocolate, this one will utilise all of it, whereas this one will have 9 joules spare, which can then be converted into body fat, which could ultimately lead to obesity again. So that should clear up the first aim, and you should now be able to describe how diet, exercise and inheritance affect your health. So on to aim two, let's look at how we evaluate food labels. So I've raided my cupboard and found two cereal boxes so we can compare their nutritional content. Now it can be a bit overwhelming at first, but let's just stick to the key things you should be looking out for. Firstly, we should focus on those food components that have been linked to obesity, namely energy. And you can see that energy is the first food constituent on both lists. So if we compare the energy content, we'll see they're both around 1600 kilojoules per 100 gram serving, so we're about even on both um, cereal products. Next up is saturated fats, which we know are linked to cholesterol levels, and we can see here that this cereal has 5.8 grams of fat, of which 0.8 grams are saturated, whereas this one has 0.6 grams of fat less, of which saturates are just 0.1 grams. So this one has a higher fat content than this one. So that is something you'd look out for if you're trying to watch your weight. Next up, if you're trying to put on some muscle mass or you're an athlete, you would definitely be looking at protein content. Now, cereals aren't a great source of protein generally, but if we compare them, you can see that this cereal has 11 grams of protein per 100 grams, whereas this one has 4.5 grams per 100 gram serving. So this one actually has a higher protein content, and unusually high for a cereal, so I assume it has probably something like nuts or something which has a high protein content. Next up is a mineral called sodium, which is a constituent of salt. Salt is very important for our nervous system, but if we have too much salt in the diet, remember it leads to high blood pressure, which has been linked to increasing the risk of heart disease. Now, if we see here, we have 0.28 grams on this cereal per 100 gram serving, whereas in this one, we have 0.88 grams. So this one has a higher salt content, and this one has a lower one. So if you're trying to watch your blood pressure, you definitely want to choose this cereal over this one. Other minerals to look out for are things like calcium, which is important for bones, and iron as well. Um, for example, uh, if you were breastfeeding, you might want to take more calcium than usual because obviously um, you will need to produce breast milk. It's also very common for people to develop a condition called anemia, which is an iron deficiency. So your blood can't carry as much oxygen. Iron's important for carrying oxygen. So you become tired, lethargic, and so on. Uh, you can also become quite pale. It's very common in f girls or females because of their menstrual cycle. So iron is also something you might want to look out for. And that is how you compare food labels to evaluate how healthy a specific food type is. So now let's look at evaluating slimming claims. What I mean by that, there are certain products that claim that they'll help you lose weight very, very quickly. And we need to look at these quite critically before we start spending lots of money on them because they're not cheap. And, you know, certain products such as milkshakes, I'm sure you've heard of, diet pills. Also, you get outrageous celebrity claims where they say they've lost hundreds of pounds in, I don't know, like a couple of hours. And you've already got to look at these quite critically. Also, controversial diets like the Atkins diet, which allow you to eat fatty foods, but at the expense of... Um, basically reducing your carbohydrate intake. 
No matter what you choose to do, it doesn't mean anything if you don't obey this golden rule. Basically, the energy you consume, the energy you get from your food, must always be less than the energy you use through exercise. That's the only way you'll achieve weight loss. So, for example, if you were on slim fast milkshakes, but you're still eating high fat around that, then you would be taking quite a lot of energy. Unless you were exercising, you would be basically not expending that energy you'd not be using it so you'd gain weight outrageous claims in the food industry are sadly commonplace um, a few years ago uh, a well-known dietitian made an outrageous claim that if you eat spinach or dark green leaves in your diet then it will help oxygenate your blood because green leaves contain chlorophyll and plants photosynthesize and when they photosynthesize using that chlorophyll they produce oxygen and that helps release more oxygen into your blood. Now that sounds very wonderful and logical unless you've studied primary school science where you've learned about photosynthesis and you're one of the first key things you'll learn is that photosynthesis requires light. Now as far as I know there's not much sunlight in your guts. In other words it's a load of nonsense. So how do we not suffer fools gladly? Here are things to consider. Firstly, the reputation of the source. So who said it? Where was it written? Was it written in a scientific journal or was it just written in tabloid press? Obviously, a scientific journal will have more credibility than tabloid papers. Secondly, who is reporting this information? Is it someone who works for one of these uh, food industry companies or is it someone impartial? That's very important so you can avoid bias in the data. Thirdly, and incredibly importantly, what is the sample size? If it's just one celebrity claiming they've lost weight, you can't use one celebrity to generalise for the entire population or even the whole world population. It just doesn't work. You need many, many people to be tested before you can confirm such results and form solid conclusions. Finally, it's also important to get backup in the form of secondary sources. Yes, scientists love backup. What that means is someone else has also carried out your study, or many people have carried out your study, to find exactly the same thing. To, in other words, the data they obtain has allowed them to form the same conclusion as you. And that is how you can evaluate slimming claims by analysing scientific studies.